Good morning. All right, well, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jennifer. I'm one of the wound ostomy nurses here at Mercy, and I'm going to be talking to you today about pressure injuries. And I'm going to be kind of the Smokey the Bear bandit today because only you can prevent them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so our objectives for today are to accurately define what a pressure injury is, identify high-risk populations who are at risk for pressure injuries, accurately identify and stage different degrees of pressure injury, identify evidence-based practice guidelines for treatment and prevention of pressure injuries, be able to speak to hospital policy and procedure regarding pressure injury prevention and treatment, and then we have a post-presentation quiz that you're going to take as a group and um, you'll have to pass that with an 80% pass rate. So George Patton Jr. Um, has been quoted saying pressure creates diamonds. Well that is definitely not the case when it comes to pressure injury. Um, despite what Madonna might say, diamonds are not a girl's or a person's best friend. Um, and so that being said, pressure creates diamonds, diamonds are not a friend. Pressure injuries are not your friend. Um, they are avoidable and uh, preventable. Um, they kind of have a ripple effect. Um, when one is acquired at um, a hospital or a long-term care facility or any kind of, um, any kind of facility or, or long-term treatment, um, they have a ripple effect. So they have been attributed to uh, increased length of stay increased risk for complications. They consume many resources such as their therapies. Um, it's increased nursing time. We know how much we have to be at the bedside for those patients that have those pressure injuries, um, regularly turning them, making sure that we're monitoring how long they're up in their wheelchairs or their bedside chairs. Um, they, in, they take up increased supplies and in, um, specialty care consults like our wound ostomy nurses, um, your infectious disease doctors, your plastic surgeons, there's a lot of resources that go into these patients that um, acquire a pressure ulcer while at a, at a facility or that come in with these chronic, um, pretty significant pressure ulcers or pressure injuries. Um, they've also been attributed to loss of function, uh, infection, pain, decreased quality of life, psychosocial inhibitions. Um, they're an increased burden on many support systems, both in and outside of the hospital. Um, and it's uh, also been linked, they've also been linked to increased mortality when the diagnosis is secondary to the primary reason for admission. Um, it's, they've actually become a national priority for many of the governing bodies um, that affect uh, reimbursement and uh, quality of care. Um, it's actually, it, the decrease of pressure injuries um, are part of the Institute for Healthcare's Improvement, the Save Five Million Lives campaign. Um, CMS and DHS also get involved when these pressure injuries occur at a facility. Uh, reimbursement has also decreased or completely gone away for hospital acquired conditions which include pressure injuries. Um, they are only, the hospital or facility is only reimbursed um, if the pressure injury is present on admission and that is why it is so important to have your head to toe skin assessment along with your head to toe physical assessment um, at the time of admission because if we catch that at the time of admission then it's not a tick for the hospital or a tick for the facility that it was uh, facility acquired. Um, there are also other uh, agencies that help with management, surveillance, and governing uh, bodies that are with the pressure injuries. Um, this can include the WOCN, or the Wound Ostomy Continence Nurse Society, um, CMS, the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel, which is kind of the creme de la creme um, panel that sets a lot of the standards and evidence-based practice guidelines for pressure injuries. Um, there's also the RNAO, which is the Registered Nurses Association of Ontario that has a lot of um, say and works very closely with the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel. And the National Ulcer, or the National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel just came out within the last, uh, I'd probably say six to eight months, and has re, um, redefined pressure ulcer to pressure injury. Um, so 
it's going to take a little bit of time but to get the education out to all the health care providers, um, especially when you're coding and billing and all of that. They're now considered pressure injuries and not pressure ulcers. They're typic they probably will still be used interchangeably for a while though until that education really becomes mainstream. So be on the lookout for that. So what is a pressure injury? The National Pressure Ulcer Advisory Panel defines a pressure injury as a localized as localized damage to the skin and or underlying soft tissue most typically over a bony prominence or related to a medical or some type of other device. Um, it's affected by many things including the microclimate, the patient's nutrition, uh, perfusion, other comorbidities and condition of the soft tissue. It may present as intact skin or an open ulcer. They may be painful or they may be neuropathic where they can't feel and it results as um, an intense prolonged pressure or pressure in combination with the shearing friction combination. Um, you often hear pressure ulcer and decubitus ulcer used interchangeably and they're actually not the same term. Um, decubitus is from the Latin origin of the reclining position and a pressure ulcer does not speak, that's more of a broad term whereas the decubitus ulcer is those can occur from those individuals that are in that prolonged reclining position or laying position. Um, in the pressure injuries can occur through other venues other than just in the lying position. You can get them from sitting down too long. You can get them from um, laying on your side too long on your, on your hips. Um, so it's not just in that kind of supine recumbent position. Um, you can also um, have pressure injuries occur from medical devices such as a C-collar or a Foley catheter, um, an IV, things like that. So there are other um, mechanisms for the pressure injury other than just laying in bed too long or sitting in your chair too long. So what causes these pressure injuries? Um, there, it's kind of a multifactorial kind of a <clears throat> approach to it. Um, age, medications, nutrition, the environment that you live in, chronic diseases, skin integrity, skin moisture, your lifestyle, those can all attribute to your risk for pressure injury and also the, the healing of a pressure injury if you do um, happen to, to have one. Um, the tissue tolerance and skin integrity is defined as the ability of the skin to handle the pressure exerted and redistribute that pressure away from that area. And your support structures in your skin act kind of like a spring. So when those springs are constantly compressed, those springs don't recoil and coil like they're supposed to, kind of like a mat, like an old box spring mattress. So over time, if you are constantly having that pressure on those springs, they're not going to bounce back and redistribute that pressure as well as they would have um, if, you know, depending on your age, your medications, things like that. Um, it's, they also are caused by prolonged dependent positioning. So that can include the physical body or those devices. Those devices are um, sitting on the skin causing pressure for long periods of time and that's dependent on being moved by either the patient or by a, um, a staff member. Shearing and friction also contribute to pressure injuries. And these are ki they kind of go hand in hand because friction and, sh and affects um, your, the shearing. So the shearing is an extrinsic factor and that includes friction. Um, it's the force is exerted in a parallel fashion to the skin um, and the result of gravity and resistance to the surfaces of the either the skin and like the bed, the chair, cushions, things like that. And the shearing typically occurs at a deeper level so you don't always see that right away. Uh, friction acts with gravity to create the shearing motion. Um, that's typically confined to the upper levels of the skin structure such as the epidermis and the dermis. So the, she the friction is what you're going to see on, kind of on the surface whereas the shearing is going on at deeper levels against the muscle and the bone. There are, um, well I know I said earlier that you can, you're a the main line of prevention for these. There are some pressure injuries that are unavoidable and those include the Kennedy terminal ulcers in your hospice or palliative care patients. Um, 
if they have controlled or uncontrolled chronic conditions, there's only so much you as a healthcare provider or loved one can do to prevent those pressure injuries. Those patients that are on or you know, seeking hospice care or palliative care that aren't stable enough to, to reposition every two hours or are just so sick that their body is trying to fight other things besides taking care of their skin, those are, are somewhat unavoidable. Um, there's things you can put, interventions you can put into place to minimize the extent of the pressure injury, but they're always going to be at risk for those pressure injuries. Um, the intensity and duration of the pressure also affect um, the, the causation of the pressure injuries. So there's two different types of pressure within our capillaries. You have the capillary pressure, which is the pressure that keeps the capillaries open or patent. And you also have your capillary closing pressure, which is the minimal pressure required to collapse those capillaries. And we all know that capillaries are what feed, or it's the microvascular system that feeds our skin. Um, so when your capillary closing pressure is higher than your capillary pressure, so the pressure exerted to close that is higher than the pressure to keep it open, that's when you have anox tissue anoxia and over prolonged periods of time, if you have that tissue anoxia, the tissues die. So you can have someone that has a higher capillary closing pressure that sits for shorter periods of time. That's going to be just as detrimental and put that patient just as at higher risk as those individuals that maybe have a lower capillary closing pressure, but they're sitting for longer periods of time. So individuals, um, you can do just as much damage sitting for short periods of time as you can for long periods of time. And as we age, um, our vessels, they age with us. Um, and those capillaries can only take so much pressure. And when those vessel walls become weak and can't withstand the pressure, that's when you become at risk for pressure injury as well. Um, Add in poor lifestyle choices such as poor diabetic control, smoking, peripheral or vascular disease. Those things contribute to those vessels deteriorating even quicker. And so if you're adding pressure to already stressed or strained vessels, it's kind of, a, again, a ripple effect. You can also have reperfusion injury. So um, on individuals that have, um, you know, lower extremity wound. And you go, the doctor goes in and they revascularize the patient, they reestablish that blood flow to the extremity. When that blood flow is reestablished, those damaged cellular byproducts can occlude and obstruct those small capillary beds, and that can, again, cause those capillaries to die. There's not tissue perfusion through the capillaries, and that can cause your tissue death, too. So um, I think as healthcare providers, especially wound nurses, we look at, oh, the patient's been revascularized, they're, they're going to be great. That's something that we need to think about, that yes, they have the, the large vessel reperfusion, but now those small vessels are at risk of having some byproducts get stuck in those vessels and can create tissue damage as well. So just something to keep in mind. So by the numbers, um, we want to know how often these pressure injuries occur. So we know they occur, but how how likely are they to happen here? How likely are they happen to happen or occur in certain um, patient populations? So the statistics can vary for prevalence of the pressure injuries due to certain inclusion and exclusion criteria. Um, some studies and some uh, organizations include damage to intact skin, such as your deep tissue injuries and stage ones, while others only include pressure injuries that are partial or full thickness, so your stage two or higher. So there's really a little bit of discrepancy there, so it's hard to say exactly how often these types of injuries occur. But there is data out there um, about the acute care setting, the long-term care setting, and the in-home care setting. So there's a difference between prevalence and incidence. Do you guys know the difference between those? Can you speak to those? 
All right, we're gonna learn. <laughs> so incidence is um, defined as those that were pressure injury free and develop a pressure injury within a certain defined period of time. That's more reflective on the quality of care given and it's used to measure how um, therapeutic and how effective interventions are at the bedside. So in the acute care setting, the incidence of pressure injuries is anywhere between seven to nine percent. In long-term care, it's anywhere between three and 31 percent. And in-home care, zero to 17 percent. So that's a pretty big range to have. Um, and it, I think this, this does show that it, it can happen in any kind of setting. It can happen in the home. It can happen in your care facilities. It can happen in the hospital. It can happen in where, wherever, wherever an individual is being taken care of. So I think nursing care facilities get a bad rap for pressure injuries for their residents. And while that is a, a large portion of where they do occur, it's not the only area that they can occur. So prevalence is the number of patients that have a pressure ulcer that are within a certain patient population at a defined period of time. So that's what we look for when we do our uh, quarterly prevalence study here. We want to know on a quarterly basis at any given time how many patients do we have that have pressure injuries, whether they were hospital acquired or not, how many have pressure injuries. And then we do a data compilation of, okay, was this present on admission? Was this hospital acquired? If it was hospital acquired, has it progressed through the staging process? Was it a stage one when they came and now it's a stage four? Or was it a stage four and we've, with our interventions, we've healed that now to a stage three or, you know, or it's completely resurfaced? So that's kind of what we're looking for when we do our prevalence study here in the hospital and we do that quarterly. So in the long-term care setting, the prevalence of a pressure injury um, is about 27% with 8.5% of those 27% being nosocomial or facility acquired. And in home care, it's anywhere between 3 and 10%. So the cost of pressure injuries is very significant. Um, in the, the data that I found, the most recent that I could find was fiscal year uh, 2007 and the average cost of a hospital acquired pressure injury was just over $43,000. That's on top of any other medical costs, diagnoses, treatments associated with their reason for admission. This is a hospital acquired pressure ulcer. And I know we've done our own data about um, a couple of patients that we've had hospital acquired pressure injuries on and it is it's between forty five and fifty thousand dollars just to treat the ulcer not on top of any other medications or treatments that they need so I mean it, it's very significant um, in fiscal year 2008 CMS stopped payment for any hospital acquired complication and that includes a stage 3 and stage 4 pressure ulcer so those complications that could have been avoided are no longer be, being covered or reimbursed or paid for. Um, and annually, about two and a half million patients um, acquire pressure injuries while under the care in a hospital facility, and that uh, can account between, for between 11 and 17 million dollars annually nationwide. So it, it's a big deal. It's a very big deal. So. Pressure injuries are non-discriminatory. They, they don't just happen to the elderly. They don't just happen to those that are immobile. They can happen to anyone at any time. There are certain populations that are more at risk for obtaining a pressure injury. That doesn't mean that this is, these are the only people that can get them. So you have your elderly and you're very young. And they have poor skin integrity and uh, poor vasculature. So like I said earlier, as we age, our skin ages and it becomes less resilient um, to redistributing that pressure. If you're very young, that vasculature and that, that support system is not as robust as it is in a healthy adult. 
those that are immobile are more prone to having the pressure injury, especially over those bony prominences. And this um, immobility can be due to uh, chronic or acute conditions. Um, so you can have someone that has MS, or you could have someone that is immobile because they, um, they had a stroke, and it's an, more of an acute issue. They're rehabbing to get back their mobility. Um, certain chronic conditions can put you at risk for pressure injury. Uh, your peripheral vascular disease, poor flow to and from those, uh, the skin, um, congestive heart failure, and COPD. You're just not perfusing quite as well as we'd like you to. Uh, your smokers, diabetics, um, stress can put a lot of stress and um, on your vessels, and so your vessels are not as um, resilient to those changes anymore, and obesity can also um, contribute to that. Poor nutrition also contributes to pressure injuries, and this includes being malnourished as well as being overweight. Um, I think we typically see, you know, you're very heavy patients and we think, oh, well, they're eating just fine while their nutrition, just because they're eating doesn't mean they're eating healthy foods, that their, their overall nutrition is, is and can be just as bad as those that are malnourished. So don't let that kind of jade your perspective on what their pressure injury risk um, is. So the National Pressure um, Ulcer Advisory Panel, like I said, is kind of the governing body for pressure injuries in the healthcare setting. And they have established um, different stages for pressure injury. So that's how we determine the severity of the pressure injury. So the pressure staging uh, gives unity and clarity and accuracy for accurately defining the type of injury and the extent of the pressure injury. You can only stage wounds that are pressure related. Let me say that again. You can only stage wounds <laughs> that are pressure related. If you do not know if it's pressure related, do not stage it. And once you have staged a pressure ulcer, you cannot reverse stage it. So if it's a stage three and it is healing to a stage two, it's always going to be a stage three. And in your documentation, you would state stage three pressure ulcer resolving or healing to now a stage two. So if in doubt, don't stage until you know it's 100% pressure related. <laughs> um, you can also get pressure injuries on your mu mucosal surfaces, um, and those can't be staged. So you would document that as a mucosal pressure injury. So now we get some lovely pictures, so hopefully no one has queasy stomachs. If you do, look away. <laughs> So this is an example of a stage one pressure injury. Um, it's defined as non-blanchable erythema of intact skin. So it's intact skin with localized non-blanchable erythema, which may appear differently in those with darkly pigmented skin. The presence of blanchable erythema or changes in sensation, temperature, firmness, may precede any of the visual changes that you see. Um, the color changes that you may see um, do not include purple or maroon discoloration. Those are defined as a deep tissue injury, and we're going to be talking about that here in a little bit. So stage one is non-blanchable erythema. So you can kind of see below it, it's, it's um, seen at the surface level. So stage two, I've got a couple pictures here. Stage two is a partial thickness skin loss with the exposed dermis. So the wound bed is viable, it's pink, it's red, it's moist, and it may also present as intact, an intact or ruptured serum filled blister. The fat layer is not exposed and deeper tissues and support structures are not visible. Granulation tissue slough and eschar are not present. And these injuries, the stage two injuries, typically occur because of adverse microclimate and shearing in the skin. Um, you, could, you see this a lot over like the heel areas or the pelvic areas. 
Um, and I think stage two is, um, it's kind of a hard one to really delineate. Um, you know, is it, is it pressure? Is it more incontinence, irritation? So it's important that those injuries that are moisture associated, um, those that are due to incontinence, such as incontinence associated dermatitis, um, skin or tape stripping from um, any kind of medical tape or device, or traumatic wounds like skin tears, burns, abrasions, those are not considered stage two pressure injuries. So we'll talk about why it's important for an assessment here in just a little bit. It's very important that you do kind of a robust assessment um, to determine appropriate staging as well. So stage three, um, we see a lot of down in our clinic. Um, it is a full thickness skin loss and the adipose or fat layer is visible and the ulcer um, has granulation tissue um, or slough present, but you can still see the base of the wound. Um, the depth of the tissue damage can vary by anatomical location and such as, you know, areas that have a lot more sub-Q fat are going to be a lot deeper than those that have, you know, aren't quite as beefy, if you will. Um, undermining and tunneling can frequently occur as well as a pibboli, which is your rolling edges. Um, the, the big difference be between a stage three and stage four, which we'll get into here in just a minute, is there are no support structures visible. So no fascia, muscle, tendon, ligament, bone, none of those are exposed. Um, if you have slough or eschar that obscures the extent of the tissue loss or the base, um, that's considered an unstageable pressure ulcer. So if you cannot see the base and you don't know what's underneath of that slough or eschar, it's considered a non-stageable or an unstageable pressure injury. So stage fours extend down into those support structures such as the fascia, the muscle, tendon, ligament, cartilage, bone. Um, again, slough or eschar may be present. Um, you typically see a lot of rolled edges or your epiboly. Um, undermining and tunneling can occur, and again, the depths vary based on the anatomical location. Um, again, in a stage four, if you cannot see the base because it's uh, covered by slough or eschar, it's considered an unstageable pressure ulcer. Pressure injury, excuse me. <laughs> okay, so next is deep tissue injury. So this is a little bit different than your stage ones. Your stage ones are your non-blanchable erythema. Deep tissue injury can be intact or non-intact skin and it's a non-blanchable like a deep red maroon purple discoloration. almost looks like a really deep bruise. Um, there can be epidermal separation revealing a dark wound bed or a blood-filled blister. Pain and temperature changes, again, often precede the skin color changes. So that's why it's important to do those assessments over those uh, tissues from head to toe with your assessments. Um, it's, it's difficult to assess, oh, I guess I should probably put some pictures up here, shouldn't I? Um, it's difficult to assess deep tissue injuries and in those with darkly pigmented skin. Um, because their skin is already dark, it's tough to tell if the skin's darker and the surrounding tissues. Um, <clears throat> the, these types of wounds or these injuries can evolve quickly um, to reveal the actual extent of the pressure injury um, or they can resolve without any tissue loss. Um, if there is necrotic tissue um, or subcutaneous tissue granulation, anything like that that are visible, this indicates a full thickness pressure injury such as an um, unstageable stage three or stage four pressure injury. Um, you're, we are not to use the deep tissue um, injury to describe any kind of vascular, traumatic, neuropathic, or dermatologic conditions. So lastly, we have our unstageable pressure injuries. So these are full thickness wounds um, and the tissue loss, the extent of the tissue damage cannot be confirmed um, because the injury is covered with eschar and or slough. So if the slough or eschar is removed, and a, a stage three or four pressure injury will most likely be revealed. Um, every once in a while you'll see 
you know, a, a partial thickness underneath there because it's healed in. Um, but very rarely have I seen that. It's usually much deeper and much more extensive. Um, stable eschar that is on the heel or an ischemic limb should not be softened or removed. So uh, as far as like documentation goes with unstageable pressure injuries, there's been a lot of kind of going back and forth as to whether you can define an unstageable pressure injury. They, they want a pressure stage. Well, you cannot accurately define and stage that pressure ulcer if that eschar and that slough is present. So in your documentation, it's important that you note it is an unstageable pressure ulcer, most likely stage three or four, but that cannot be determined at this time due to 100% eschar slough cover. So you're accurately defining that pressure injury without guessing what's underneath that eschar. Again, if you don't, if you don't know, don't just throw a stage out there. Always ask someone who may know, such as our wonderful wound ostomy nurses, <laughs> um, and, and they can help you from there. Any questions about the staging? Yes, Miss Diane, come on up to the mic. <laughs> Mm -hmm. as the, as the mm -hmm. that um, so I know at least in the in hospital we still have to say pressure also mm -hmm. um, to cover the whole Yeah, yep. And so and that I kinda hit on that a little earlier. Within the last six to eight months the national pressure advisory panel came out with redefining pressure ulcer as pressure injury. So I the with the new coding and everything that's still kind of trying to catch up with that. So for right now, until that catches up and that language has been widely um, accepted and, and um, educated upon, you're going to see them used interchangeably. So pressure ulcer, pressure injury are going to be used interchangeably until that coding and that, that billing kind of get back up to par with, with um, the advisory panel's recommendations. So. All right. What's that? Yes, it's pressure also right now. But the new terminology that has been released is pressure injury. So that's what I based this presentation up was, was the most current and available data and terminology. So you can see here that this is fun. Can you see that? Um, you can see that that's 100% slough covered. So you would not accurately be able to stage or define what type of injury that is. It would be an unstageable pressure injury. All right, so we've defined all of the stages and now we need to know how do we assess a pressure injury? How do we assess for pressure injuries? And what do we do if we, we have a patient that develops a pressure injury or we discover one on, on our assessment? So it's important to do a very thorough um, assessment on your patients. When they are admitted in every um, eight hours or every shift assessment, you need to look the patient over from head to toe, front to back, in and out of skin folds. Um, visual visualization is very, very, very important because, as you know, you can't see your behind, and if you're not moving the best, you certainly aren't going to be able to see anything, you know, on your lower legs or especially on your back or, or buttocks. So it's important that we be those eyes for those patients and for all of our patients. Um, the history and physical is important. And while you may not have to go over that in detail with the patient, it's important to know what kinds of medications and chronic conditions they are living with and what kind of medications they are taking. And kind of set that trigger off in your head. OK, they're on that. They're on prednisone. They're on Coumadin. Those are two heavy hitters that can affect your skin. Um, so maybe I need to be a little extra cautious when I'm putting my IVs in or when we're doing a bed bath, putting lotions on, things like that. Um, so just looking over their medications and their history is important to do. Um, appropriate staging and wound description. Um, again, if you don't know how to accurately define a pressure injury, don't just decide on, oh, I think that looks like a stage two. I'm going to define that as a stage two. Make sure you reach out to your resources that you have in order to accurately define and stage those. And I brought a few um, 
resources that we have down in clinic to accurately define and stage pressure injuries. Um, again, if you don't know if it is pressure related or if the primary etiology is pressure, do not stage it. <laughs> um, you want to make sure that you are cleaning the wound and the surrounding skin gently but thoroughly and you are doing so in adequate lighting to make sure you are getting the best visualization of the patient's skin. Um, they can have poor nutrition. What are they eating like? Um, do they have barriers, physical or cognitive barriers, um, to obtaining adequate nutrition? Um, and what are their lab values like? Their albumin is a very, albumin and prealbumin are two key indicators of, as to what is going on with their nutrition status, kind of over time and at that point in time as well. Um, what is the etiology of the pressure injury? Is it over a bony prominence? Is it um, because they are, have decreased mobility due to acute or chronic conditions like we talked about earlier? Is it device related? Is, was that fully sitting across their leg all night with no securing device and now it's created a pressure injury because they're so edematous? We've seen that a lot actually. IVs, depending on where they're at, the location. You know, if it's in the bend of an arm or at a wrist, if their wrist is bent or they're contracted and that IV is there, that, can cause, that little hub can cause pressure underneath of that. So kind of looking at what is the mode of the, the pressure injury. Is there presence of infection? Is it contaminated, colonized, or is it a full-blown infection? Do they have any psychosocial deficiencies? Um, are they isolated because of the embarrassment related to the pressure injury? because of the odor. Um, they don't want to have to burden their family members or support staff in order to take care of this. They don't want to be a burden on anybody. What psychosocial things are going on? It's important to establish treatment goals with your patient as well and doing that with your assessment. If the patient wants to keep the wound clean and free of infection, then that's what our goal should be tailored towards. If they want to heal this pressure injury and they want to get back to their way of life, then that, then that can kind of drive your interventions and drive your recommendations to the provider as to kind of what the, where the patient's at with that. So you have to meet the patient at their level and, and figure out what do they want from their pressure injury or pressure ulcer um, care while they're here. And then your reassessment. Any change in patient condition warrants a new physical assessment, and that physical assessment includes a head-to-toe skin assessment under any pressure or any um, medical device under all skin folds. Um, the uh, National um, Clearinghouse guidelines state that a physical assessment should be done every eight hours. Um, here at Mercy, and we'll get into this here in just a little bit. There, depending on what unit you're on, that kind of depends on how often you do your, your physical assessment. So we'll talk about that here in just a minute. But the national guideline um, clearinghouse states that a physical assessment should be done at least every eight hours. So how do we prevent these pressure injuries from occurring? There's many different tools we have at our disposal here in the hospital, um, in our facility, to assess for a patient's risk for pressure injury. Um, there's different screening tools. Um, you, uh, we have a pressure ulcer prevention program here in place. Um, looking at, again, it kind of falls back to your assessment, looking at their comorbidities and a multidimensional approach. Um, we are never alone here in the hospital. We always have someone that will help us. So if you are concerned about a patient's nutritional status, if you're concerned about the way the skin is looking based off of, you know, compared to your last assessment. You can, you can speak with the providers about getting a, a wound nurse consult, about getting a nutrition consult. We are a team here, and it's important that we bring all those members of the team in to help prevent pressure injuries. And if one does occur, that we are bringing everyone to the table to help heal and prevent any further damage to those tissues. Um, the scale or the, the main screening tool we use here in the hospital is the Braden scale. Um, so I'm going to skip ahead here. I don't know if you can, it didn't come out quite as clear as I'd like, but there are six different areas um, in the, the Braden skin score scale. 
So um, there's memory, or I'm sorry, sensory perception, moisture, activity, mobility, nutrition, and friction and shear. And based on your assessment of that patient at that time, you give your patient a one, two, three, or four, and I wish you could see this better, but there's definitions underneath of each one, and those are available in your EPIC um, under the Braden Skin Assessment and your physical assessment, the definitions of what one, two, three, and four constitute. It's important to use your assessment and your judgment of the patient when you're doing the Bra your Braden assessment and not based off of what you, you got in report. So if you got in report from the previous nurse, well, they were up and moving and, you know, and they're a, a standby assist. But for you, they're, a, you know, a one assist, mod assist to get up with a Sara study. Okay. That's your assessment. You need to go off of what your assessment of that patient is, not what your previous predecessor told you. Because that could be a change in condition and, again, warrants another skin assessment. So go off of what your data is for you at that point in time. So based off of your assessment, you will, again, define a one, two, three, or four for each of the six sections, and that will give you a total number. And that will give you the risk assessment for your patient um, for a pressure injury or, or skin damage. Anything below a 12 here at Mercy automatically warrants a wound ostomy nurse consult and that is per one of the hospital's policies and protocols so you can put that order in without a physician's um, order. Any questions about the Braden scale? Our wonderful Jane Corber actually got to meet uh, the uh, maker of the Braden scale. So that was, that was kind of cool. If you ever have any questions, um, she's a good resource to kind of reach out to as well. Um, in the outpatient setting, um, you know, we, we, I don't think we really typically think of our patients that come in and that's not kind of the first thing in our mind is, oh, this patient might be at risk for a pressure injury that c comes in for a four hour blood treatment, a four hour IVIG treatment. They are there for five hours for IV antibiotics. That patient laying in that bed for four hours that's very sick and weak is just at high risk of a pressure injury as those that are up in the house. So I, I, that's something I would really like to start some of the outpatient areas thinking about. And your outpatient areas also include your cath labs, your ORs, things like that. It's patients that are in that dependent position for hours. The OR is uh, a big area. Um, we don't see a whole lot of pressure injury coming from the OR. They do a very good job about um, padding those areas. Um, they have different devices they can use to help with that. Um, but that, that is uh, something to think about if your patient's been in the OR. They've been down for a while. Their, their tissue could be damaged. You may not see it. So keep that in mind. Um, the recommendations are if a patient's going to be in the outpatient setting for longer than two hours, the following questions need to be considered when caring for that patient. Um, are they better wheelchair bound? Are they going to be immobile or sedated for longer than two hours? Are they incontinent of urine or stool? Um, do they have a history of or do they currently have a pressure injury? Do they appear visibly malnourished? And again, that malnourished can in include very small, bony, thin, and very large, a lot of adipose tissue, obese. Um, and what's their skin perfusion like? Patients that may be alert and oriented, they're sitting up, they're able to move themselves a little bit in a bed or on the cot when they're wherever they're at, but they're on three liters of oxygen. They're probably not perfusing quite as well as we would like them to be. So that's something else to keep in mind. Kind of went through the brain skin score there. So we come across a patient that either has a hospital acquired pressure injury or presents with a pressure injury. So what are we going to do to treat that? We are going to um, minimize and eliminate the friction or shear. We're going to offload those areas of pressure and there are, we have a lot of tools at our disposal to do that, to minimize or eliminate that friction or shear. Um, 
We have those awesome new lift devices and turning devices that the hospital just implemented within the last year or so. Um, the head of the bed angle, we can control that. Um, it's recommended that if able and if uh, patient condition warrants to keep the head of the bed at less than 30 degrees or right at 30 degrees. Um, skin hydration and skin lubrication, putting lotions on, barrier creams on, avoiding pushing and pulling the patient on those um, stagnant surfaces. Um, bedpans are a great example of how a pressure injury can occur from trying to push that underneath the patient or pulling it out because you can't get them turned over quite as adequately as, as you'd like. Um, not using the, the maxi slides or those devices that we, we have, those are great for minimizing that pressure and, and friction. As far as offloading goes, there are different support surfaces that you can use. We have the offloading um, heel boots um, that can be implemented by nursing without a doctor's inter or, uh, order. Um, the different support surfaces for the beds. Um, it, again, you as a nurse have the power to say this patient is at risk of pressure injury based off my assessment or they have a pressure injury. You can implement a low air loss mattress surface or the alternating pressure pump mattress surfaces without a physician's order. Those are nursing interventions. Um, seat cushions. You can speak with the therapists about getting some type of seat cushion for their wheelchair, for their bedside chair. Um, they have, we have those, um, the blue soft care cushions. You can put that at the bedside without a physician's order. So there's a lot of things that nurses can do that I, I think we forget about that we can do to prevent or help those that are at risk or have a pressure injury. Moisture management is the next. All right, so moisture management, again, <coughs> excuse me, that's within your nursing scope of control and practice. Are they incontinent? Checking for incontinence every two hours. Having your patient care tech help you with that. Have your, your support staff helping you with a toileting program if they are incontinent. Looking at what types of um, surfaces are underneath of them. Incontinence pads, disposable incontinence pads. If they're very moist, your low air loss mattresses can help with moisture control. Are they perspiring? Um, looking at at kind of all of those things when you're doing your assessment um, and, and putting interventions in place or speaking with the provider if needed about putting interventions in place to help with with the moisture management. Um, again, a dietitian referral. What's their oral intake like? What kind of barriers do they have? Physical, cognitive, etc. Um, what is um, their support system like at home or who's going to be helping them when they are discharged, if they are discharged with this pressure injury. Um, educating not only the patient but the family about what is going to be needed to take care of this injury and how this may have occurred, um, at how it's a multifactorial kind of thing um, that we've, we've spoken about earlier. And then your assessment. A frequent assessment is, and is very, very important and you are the, the eyes for your patients while they are under your care here at the hospital. Um, so you want to make sure you're doing a frequent assessment and a uh, complete and thorough assessment with your patients. So here at Mercy, what do we do? What do we have in place as far as pressure ulcer, pressure injury, treatment, prevention, assessment, that kind of a thing? There really is no set policy or procedure saying this is the way things need to be done. Instead, we go by the evidence-based guidelines that are available through different venues. And that is what the hospital speaks to when we um, implement our interventions at the bedside. So as far as a physical assessment, I, I was able to find um, different types of units have different standards as to when and how often they do their, their assessments. And again, these physical assessments include a head-to-toe skin assessment. So that's why um, I kind of focus in on more the physical assessment versus just the skin assessment. So for those that are adult, which is defined as age 13 or older in the intensive care unit, um, they do an all-system assessment on admission and then every four hours with focused reassessments on any abnormal systems every two hours. For those that are considered um, an adult, again, age 13 or older, and they're a post-surgical patient, no matter what floor they're on, um, it's 
it's based um, on at least every eight hours, but it's also based, excuse me, on the type of procedure that they had um, and how they present back to you. So if they're still sedated, probably gonna wanna do that every two hours instead of every four hours. If they are real painful and not moving quite as often, again, you're gonna wanna kind of tailor that eight hour assessment to maybe every four hours. So you're using your nursing judgment based on the patient condition when they return to you from any kind of a surgical procedure. Um, inpatient rehab, excuse me, which I was a little bit surprised at, theirs is on admission in every 12 hours. So I, that kind of surprised me a little bit there because those patients are typically those that are in rehab, aren't moving quite as well, but on the kind of flip side of that, they are up a lot during the day with their therapies and all of that. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, for those that are adult, again, age 13 or older, um, on a med surge floor, it's on a mission in every eight hours. Again, unless um, their condition warrants a more frequent uh, assessment based on your nursing judgment. And I've kind of spoken to this a little bit. There are nursing interventions that you can put into place um, should a pressure injury be found or suspected, and that includes those offloading heel boots, the support surfaces, a repositioning schedule, um, over-the-counter barrier creams, um, an incontinence schedule. So there are many things at our disposal that we as nurses can do to help prevent um, those pressure injuries. Five key messages to prevent pressure ulcers, and the ultimate message um, it's kind of towards the end of, of the video. So um, we'll go ahead and watch this. The only way I can describe it is though I was sat on top of a hot plate on the cooker. It was horrific. So angry because I'm in bed for so many hours. It's a very large cavity and it can be fatal. The other stupid thing that I did, I didn't tell anybody. Pressure ulcers, often known as bed sores, can be very serious. The area may be very red and inflamed. I couldn't believe it when I saw it, you know. It looked like a horrible, overripe tomato on my buttocks. A really nasty pressure ulcer can be a deep cavity. You may be able to see muscle or bone or tendon. The wound may bleed, the wound may weep, fluid. They can be very foul smelling, like rotting flesh. The worst thing that can happen is complications causing death. The pain was terrible. People don't realise how they do impact on lives. I couldn't sleep, no sleep, day and night, and at times I felt reduced to tears. Awareness is the key. Being the silly old twit that I am, I didn't complain to him. My wife saw me wincing. If we're not able to look after our own skin, then somebody else needs to be doing it for us. They need to be looking out for any signs of discoloration, numbness, pain, itching, heat, or hardness. I got one right on the coccyx at the bottom of my spine. The most common area for a pressure ulcer to develop is on bony prominences, the bottom, the ankle bone, the heel, the base of the spine, bony shoulders, elbows. I'm on dialysis three days a week, four hours at a stretch. You're bound to sit still. Pressure ulcers can happen to anybody at any age. We see a lot of patients that are elderly, disabled, pregnant women during labour, Young children can get pressure ulcers, anybody that's got poor mobility. The reason I'm sitting all the time is I've got a spinal problem. I use my chair to get me up on my feet and stand if it's only two or three minutes. The five key messages to prevent pressure ulcers are to look at the surface that you sit on and that you sleep on at night. It might be that you need a special cushion or a special mattress that helps redistribute the pressure evenly. Always check your skin. Skin inspection is so important in picking up skin changes early on. Always keep moving, keep mobile. The ideal for somebody at home is to move every two hours. Incontinence and increased moisture, any moisture against the skin will make that skin more fragile and vulnerable to breaking down. 
And then nutrition and hydration. A good healthy diet is very important in preventing pressure ulcers. So S-skin is S and then skin. The worst thing I did was put up with it. I should have gone long before I did. The message that we want people to take away is help us to help you to prevent pressure ulcers. I'm hoping we're going to see the end of the, you know, I'm determined. <laughs>